Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Vine Church Online. I am the teaching pastor here. My name is Michelle Eich, and it's great to have you here this morning. So you may recognize that my background is a little bit different today. I am traveling, I'm with some of our kids, and I'm on Nana duty, which is making me extremely happy. Uh, I've had an opportunity to babysit one of our granddaughters and uh, visit our daughter who's having twins in February and looking at crib set up and everything, just so excited. So um, that's why I'm in a different location this morning, but that's the beauty of having church online, even though I love being with you all. So today I'm talking about endurance and, you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes in this uh, race, I can feel a little bit weary and even to the point of giving up and God doesn't want us to give up. He doesn't want us to quit. So he has things in his word to keep us encouraged and that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. So on this journey, you know, we've heard uh, little sayings like it's going to be a hot summer and then nothing really happens. And then it's going to be a September to remember and then nothing really happens. And now we're in a uh, red October waiting for something to happen. And I've talked before about how a lot of the prophets are saying that there is another Red Sea moment coming. And the when the original Red Sea moment happened, of course, with Moses, God set his people free, set them free from Pharaoh, from Egypt, from slavery. And uh, we are in slavery, okay? And I'm not going to go into great detail about that, but we are in bondage and sometimes we don't even realize it. And God is setting his people free. And so they're saying that there's another Red Sea moment coming where God is going to part the sea, make a way out of slavery, make a way out of bondage. And the same action that sets God's people free destroys the enemy. Amen. That is so incredibly powerful. And so that's what we're waiting for. And I've been waiting for this for a long time. And uh, like I said, in the natural, it can look like nothing is happening, but we know that God is working behind the scenes. We know that his timing is perfect. And so we continue to wait with him, not just for him. And I'll be talking about that this morning. So I want to start off by reading a story I heard about uh, several years ago about a lady named Florence Chadwick, who was an incredible swimmer, and this is her story. In 1952, a woman named Florence Chadwick decided to attempt the 26-mile swim between the California coastline and Catalina Island. During her swim, Chadwick traveled with a team whose job it was to keep an eye out for sharks and be prepared to assist in the event of unexpected cramps, injury, or fatigue. Roughly 15 hours into her swim, a thick fog began to set in, clouding Chadwick's vision and confidence. Her mother happened to be in one of the boats at the time as Chadwick relayed to her team, she didn't think she could complete the swim. She swam for another hour before deciding to call it quits. As she sat in the teetering boat, she discovered if she just continued on for another mile, she would have reached Catalina Island. Many people quit a dream on the brink of its realization. It's when the challenges feel the most daunting that we're often closer to our destination than we feel ourselves to be. Okay, so swimming a mile might seem a little bit extreme, but this was a 26 mile race and she quit at 25 when she only had one more mile to go. But because of the fog, she couldn't see the finish line. And we're kind of in this fog of war right now where things are confusing. We're getting conflicting reports. We don't know what's going on. Uh, that is a situation. And trust me, we are in a war. We are in a spiritual battle. We're in a war and it's a different kind of war. It's not the kind of war where there are planes flying over, dropping bombs on us. This is a, a cyber war. It's a war of infiltration. I've talked a little bit about this before but we are in a battle. And so when you're in a battle like this, there is this thing called fog of war where things seem confusing. And is it friendly fire? Is it enemy? We don't know. And so we really need to be connected with God so we can know what's going on because he is our commander in chief, right? He's the general and the angel with the angel of armies. And we are part of the army of God fighting this battle against evil, all right? We're not fighting people. We're not fighting flesh and blood. We're fighting principalities. And we've talked about that before as well. But there's this thing because of the fog, right? 
if she, if it wasn't a foggy day, she could have seen the end and know, Hey, I just have a little bit more to go. Even if you're completely exhausted, you've got enough left in the tank to finish the race. Right. But if you can't see the finish line, she gave up and, you know, was probably super upset about it. Like realizing, wow, I was so close, but I couldn't see the finish line. I was in the fog. I was confused and I gave up. And that's something that can happen with people. And we don't want that to happen to us. Amen. So I'm going to be sharing again, some biblical things that we can do uh, to stay encouraged so that we don't quit and we can finish our race. Amen. So the first one is perspective. I've given a message on perspective before, but basically seeing things from God's point of view, seeing the big picture. All right. We see just a tiny little sliver of something. We cannot see the big picture. And uh, I know it's fall and it's like, you know, uh, one of the things that people like to do in this season is to go through a corn maze. Okay. And this is something <laughs> I would, I'd probably be stuck in a corn maze unless my husband was with me for hours, days. I mean, nightfall would come and I would still be going around the same circle. I, my sense of direction is terrible. But what if I was on the phone with somebody who was in a helicopter above me and could give me directions out of there, like turn right, go five steps, turn left. I could be out of that corn maze in minutes. All right. If you had somebody connected on a higher level, seeing from a different perspective, right? Not seeing the corn in front of you, but seeing from above, it would be super easy. And that's what God does for us. All right. Through the Holy Spirit, we can get a different perspective on things and see things differently. And when I preached on this before, I talked about Paul. And now I preached last week on uh, how to weather the storm. And I talked about Paul being shipwrecked and being bit by the viper and all the things that happened to him. But that was just a tiny piece of the trials that he endured. But what did Paul say about those trials? Check out 2 Corinthians 4, starting with verse 16. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So when you are weary, when you're struggling, when you're dealing with the fog of war, if you are connected to the Holy Spirit and you're connected to God and you have that aerial view, then you can endure it. And I know that this life is not the end for me. I know that when my heart stops beating, I am going to go be in the presence of Jesus for all eternity in heaven with him. Now, that is just so incredible. And so Paul was able to say, look, I've gone through all of these things and it's been super difficult. But in comparison to what I'm going to, it's nothing. It's a light affliction. And God gave Paul a little peek into heaven so he could say that here on earth. He knew where he was going. He knew what was in store for him for all eternity. And that is what gave him the power and the desire to endure the trials and tribulations on this earth, in this lifetime. So when we have an eternal perspective, we know this too shall pass. Amen. And I've been alluding to something that, you know, I've been going through and uh, in our family and my husband and I are going through this thing. And, you know, someday I'm going to have an awesome testimony, but right now I'm just in the midst of it. And I have a prayer partner, somebody I went to Bible college with, and she and I have started to do prayer calls weekly. And she's the one who went through the hurricane. And I referenced her and her husband in last week's message. So if you didn't get to listen to that, I'd check it out. But anyway, uh, I was transparent with her and I shared some things. I didn't go into great detail, but I kind of gave her a Reader's Digest version of what was going on. And you know what she said to me? She said, Michelle, this is a light affliction. And it just got me right here. And it got me there in a good way, in a good way. Like, I didn't need her to say, oh, boo-hoo, oh, no, this is so terrible, I'm so sorry, and this just stinks, and it's so bad, and I did not need to hear that, I did not need drama, I did not need trauma, 
I needed somebody who could come to me from a godly perspective and speak truth into my life. And she said, this is a light affliction. Now, if somebody, you know, Paul had been beaten and shipwrecked and all the things that happened to him and, you know, say, well, this is a light affliction. Those were his words, light affliction, light affliction. If it, if this is all we have and when we stop breathing and go six feet under, that's it. We're just dead and there's no eternity. Like it's not a light affliction. It's a big deal. But the perspective, the eternal perspective, the aerial view helps us to see this is a light affliction. And by her saying that to me, like that shifted my whole thinking. And I just see it like that. Like, you're right. In comparison to where I'm going to be for all eternity, even if this thing doesn't work out the way I'm praying that it will. Light affliction. Bam. That was so good. And a lot of us want to surround ourselves with people who are going to be like, oh, pity party. Oh, give me some attention. Oh, let me boohoo and everything like that. And I'm not, I don't want that because it's not going to benefit me. I need somebody who's going to speak the truth in love. And that's exactly what she did. And I wasn't offended at all. I was like, praise God. Thank you for encouraging me. That was beautiful. I appreciate it. So, you know, perspective is huge. And so this is not the end all be all. We're going to be with Jesus for all eternity. And when we look back on these days, it's going to be like, wow, I kind of overreacted <laughs> about some things. That's so important. Okay. The next thing that we can do, number two, is to magnify the Lord, not our situations. All right. Magnify the Lord, not our situations. Now, if you have ever looked at something through a magnifying glass or a microscope, you can take a flea, a, a flea or a chigger, which we've had to deal with here recently, something super tiny. And you put that under the magnifying glass with a microscope and that thing looks like a scary creature and huge and a monster. And it's, and it's terrible. All right. We magnify the problem, not the problem solver. So very important that we don't magnify the problem and we magnify God. Now, God is already big, right? He's already big. But when we focus on him and not the problem, it is going to shift the way that we see things and it's going to help encourage us along the journey, okay? And that's what I'm choosing to do. It is super easy <laughs> to get into the routine and get into the rut of magnifying problems. When we have an orphan spirit, it makes us feel better. It makes us feel better to get on social media, to get on Facebook, feeling sad, and then throw up on everybody with all, all the things that are going on. And then it's like, oh, I want people to give me attention, which is a false sense of love. All right. And, and, and just drama and all this attention. Oh, all these people like my post and give me so many sad faces and sad emojis. And I just... I, I feel so much better because I got all this fake love attention and, and that's not the way that we should be operating as believers. Okay. So you have a choice. You can magnify the problem or you can magnify the Lord. And the Bible tells us to magnify the Lord. Check out this verse. Psalm 34, one says this, Oh, come, let us magnify the Lord together. Let his praise be continually on our lips. If you're, if, the, if you're praising God with your lips continually, you know what? You're not going to have any time to speak about the problem and to magnify it. It's like, God's got this. This is not a big deal for him. I'm going to rest and I'm going to trust. And that's going to encourage us because if we magnify our problems, they will become so overwhelming that we give up and quit. They just seem too big. I'm sure the Israelites were thinking about that. Wow. Look at all these plagues coming. The more that uh, Moses goes to Pharaoh, the more bricks we got to make without straw. Things are getting harder and harder for us. Is God going to come through for us? They had a promise from God just like we do. And God had a really awesome way to set them free. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sure none of them were thinking, you know what I bet God's going to do, guys? I bet God is going to park that sea right there and we're just going to walk right across on dry land and then... He's going to close the sea and all the enemy, you know, all of Pharaoh's guys on the chariots are going to drown. I bet that's what's going to happen. It's like, mm, I don't have to figure out how God is going to do it. I just trust that he will because he said he would. 
He said he would, and that settles it for me. Amen. It's so good. All right. So we magnify the Lord, not our problems and our situations, and that will definitely encourage us. Amen. <clears throat> the next thing is focus. What are you looking at? Okay. So we're talking about endurance and the, uh, the race is kind of a metaphor in this particular situation. The woman was swimming a long distance, 26 miles, uh, running a marathon, running cross country. You know, <laughs> I don't run and I did, I can still run, which I learned this summer when I was approaching a tree that had a snake in it. I can still run, <laughs> but like if you see me running, chances are there's a bear behind me. <laughs> I'm just saying, but I, I'm not a runner, but anyway, um, we're running a race, okay? Metaphorically, we're running a race as Christians. And where is our focus? Where should our eyes be? Our eyes should be on the finish line, what we're going toward. I said this in a recent sermon. I said, you know, we're running our race. We're looking at the finish line. And then somebody up in the cheap seat, somebody up in the stand starts saying, you're terrible. You don't even deserve. You're not even worthy to be running. The you call yourself in you know, all these things. Should I go run up the stairs and start arguing with that person? Well, yes, I am because blah, blah, blah. No, I ignore that. And I keep my eyes on the finish line. I keep my eyes on the prize and I keep moving forward to my destination. Now, I was listening to a friend share the other day and she said her son was in a cross country race and he's running along and, you know, it's a long run and the finish line was like around a corner and he couldn't see it. So if you're running cross country, you see the finish line, what do you do? You start using that little bit of uh, gas you have left in the tank to run faster and finish strong. But because the finish line was around the corner, he couldn't see it and he turned the corner and boom, there's the finish line and he didn't have enough time to run quickly. So his mom, <laughs> who was there, mom being mom, was there cheering him on and she's like Bobby you're so close to the finish line you know it's time to kick it into high gear and he listened to the voice of his mom good kid and he was able to finish strong and run to the finish line and instead of just jogging there and so that was so powerful and you know we have that voice we have the Holy Spirit who can encourage us the Holy Spirit is the best encourager guys Connecting with God on a personal level to say, keep going. You're almost there. You're almost there, Michelle. Don't quit. Don't quit. Because when you're in a race, when are you the most tired? At the end. And it, it would be so easy to quit and give up. But if you understand the voice of God saying to you, you're so close. Hang in there. I'm about ready to part that sea. I'm about ready to move. Do not give up because there are so many opportunities to give up right now. I mean, guys, there's a lot going on in the world, in our nation, with each of us personally. And if we are not clinging to God and his promises, we are going to get sucked in and we are going to get so discouraged that we're, we're going to give up on our race. And that is absolutely not what we should be doing right now. Amen. So, um, yeah, keeping your eyes on God, keeping your eyes on the finish line, keeping your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. I love this verse in Hebrews. Hebrews 12, 2 says this, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning at shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Boom. There it is. I mean, come on, Jesus right there at the end of his life as he was going to the cross and everything before that, he could have given up, but he didn't do it. He considered the joy before him. You know what I think the joy before him was? Seeing us in eternity and knowing that everything that he was doing was for our benefit. It was love that kept him going. Love for God the Father and love for us because he knew that going to the cross was paying for our salvation, paying for our healing, 
making a way for us to have a relationship with God. That is so beautiful. I love that, that we've got to keep our eyes fixed on him. Amen. If we're going to have endurance in this race that we're running. All right. The next one is being very careful about who you're surrounding yourself with. Okay. I don't think that as Christians, we should be in the holy huddle, <laughs> just being around other believers and creating a utopia and all that. We are to be like Jesus. You know, he was hanging around with sinners. All right. He was hanging around people who needed, uh, who needed him, who needed love, who needed uh, what he had to offer him, offer them. Amen. And so um, at the same time, we need to be careful in our relationships and who we let in our inner circle. So I have like an outer circle and then a smaller circle. And then I have like an inner circle and I'm very, I, I don't let just anybody into my inner circle. Why? Because that's going to suck the life out of me. <laughs> it just is. Okay. I need to be very careful. And as I've said before, birds of a feather flock together, right? Are you surrounding yourself with chickens who are afraid of everything? Ostriches who bury the head in the sand and don't want to deal with anything. Vultures who are just like flying around you waiting for something to happen so they can devour you. Or eagles who are soaring to new heights, soaring on the wind, soaring on the Holy Spirit. That is so important to understand. And so if you're feeling super weary and drained and tired and exhausted on this journey, who is in your inner circle? Are you setting boundaries or are you letting people suck the life out of you? Now, as I've grown in my faith and I've become more secure in who I am in Christ, and I've talked a lot about identity, I am not a people pleaser anymore. So I can say no to people. I used to have a hard time saying no to people. Why? Because I needed them to like me because I wasn't confident in my own self. And so I needed the accolades and the applause of other people. I don't need that anymore. I'm living my life for the audience of one, that's God. And not everybody likes that, and that's okay. Not everybody liked when Jesus did what the Father said to do and, you know, all of that. Not everybody liked that. Too bad. He was so confident in his own identity and his relationship with God the Father that he did what he was supposed to do, and he didn't perform for people. All right? So if you're exhausted, look at your relationships. Look at the people around you. If you let people in and you don't set boundaries, they will suck the life out of you. And this is going to be very difficult for you to endure and run your race if you're being drained by other people and getting sucked into their drama and their trauma. Ooh, I could preach on that. All right. So I like to be, I like to have friends who are ahead of me, like who are spiritually ahead of me. They've been walking with God for a longer time than I have and people that I'm encouraging along the way, as well as people who don't even know God. But the inner circle, it's pretty small. Amen? All right. All right. <clears throat> the next thing is pruning. And I, <laughs> I feel like I'm in for a pruning, right? Pretty soon. Like, I feel like I'm coming into that season. All right? So God is a master gardener. And he will prune. He will prune us. He will cut away the branches that are dead or not producing fruit. Okay? So years ago, my husband and I had acreage. I know my husband's listening and smiling right now, but anyway, um, we had 20 fruit trees and we had this one particular apple tree that was pretty big, but it would not produce apples. I mean, like maybe a few. And it's like, this tree is mature enough that it should be producing more apples. So my husband and I were like, you know what, this, this tree needs prune. He's like, I'll take care of it, which kind of made me quiver a little bit because uh, yeah, he liked to get the chainsaw going and he, I called it a, a stump when he got done, but he cut that thing way back. I mean, way back. And I was, I was not really happy about it. I was like, you about killed that tree. It's a stump now. He's like, it's not a stump. It'll be fine. Well, guess what? The next season, the next spring and summer, that tree was loaded with apples. So here's my public apology, honey. You were right. I know you love to hear those words. You were right to prune that tree way back. So <clears throat> when a tree has too many branches, it's expending its energy to the branches, not to doing what it's supposed to do, which is fruit production. I don't 
plant an apple tree to have shade. I plant an apple tree to have apples. And so all of this work and all this effort that we have, all this busyness in our lives, all the things that we do, right? And are we producing fruit or are we just busy? And are we just making branches? And so I know I'm coming into a season of pruning and I'm partnering with God. I'm partnering with the Holy Spirit to say, God, what are we cutting out? This isn't pulling weeds. This is cutting away perfectly good branches of the tree so that the tree can now use its energy in a more focused way to produce fruit and do what it's supposed to do. Okay. And so that's the purpose of pruning. So God may remove somebody out of your life. God may uh, take away a hobby. God may ask you to quit a job. If maybe you're working three jobs and you're just like, I'm so exhausted. I can't focus on my relationship with God and all of this. You really need to connect with God. And sometimes I'm just like, here, I hand them the pruning shears and pruning is guess what? It's painful to have parts of you, parts of your life cut out. We don't want anything cut out. It's like, I can do more. And that's my personality. Like, oh, I can take on another thing and another thing and another thing. But when I do that, I'm not producing fruit, I'm producing branches. And that wastes my time and energy. So if you're exhausted, it might be you're doing too much. John 15, uh, verse one says this, I'm the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. We wanna bear fruit. Okay, and we don't want to waste time doing things that maybe make us look busy and maybe make us feel good, but are not effective in the kingdom. So if you're exhausted and weary and you're not, you know, struggling with endurance, maybe you need a good pruning and I know I'm coming into one. <laughs> I'll let you know how that goes. I hope it's not going to be like that apple tree that my husband cut way, way back because that was a lot. But he was right. It did produce more apples the next year. All right. I said it and I'm not going to say it again. <laughs> Amen. All right. Last thing is waiting on the Lord. So if you read the Bible, it says wait on the Lord a lot. And it's not like waiting, like twiddling your thumbs, do to do and waiting for God to show up. Um, it can be like a waiter, a, ten, a waiter at a restaurant attends you, brings you things. Like it can be in that mode of serving. But one of the things that God showed me, or he spoke to me many years ago, which totally shifted my way of thinking and it blew my mind, actually, is he said, you don't wait on me, you wait with me. Mm, yes. I'm not like waiting on God to show up. He's already shown up. I'm waiting with him and we're on a journey together. And that is a beautiful thing. You know, there's a, a thing I see it on social media a lot, you know, it's like you're you're waiting for God to open the next door. So praise him in the hallway. That's good. You know, but I'm not waiting on him. I'm waiting with him. He's always with me. And I can be an impatient person at times. Now, patience is a fruit of the spirit. And as I walk with the Holy Spirit, I've learned to be more patient over time. But, uh, you know, I, I can think of times when I was like, God, if you tell me to wait on you, I'm going to lose my mind. I cannot wait anymore. I need something to happen yesterday. Right. And with this whole process of this Red Sea moment and God shifting things on our nation, you know, it's like dealing with all this evil, seeing all this evil, seeing the things that the enemy is doing to destroy our world, to destroy our nation. Like, like, okay, God, we're waiting, we're waiting, but I'm waiting with you. And again, he has that higher view perspective and he knows what he's doing. And he wants everyone to come to faith in him. He doesn't want anybody to perish. So sometimes the waiting is for more people to come to faith in him. Amen. So waiting is something I'm learning to do better. I sometimes don't like it, but if we're going to have endurance, if we're going to run this race effectively, then we have to wait on God and we're waiting with God on the journey. You know, we've all probably taken trips with our kids or people who say, are we there yet? I used to, you know, we used to drive our kids to Florida and it's like 20 some hours in the minivan with lots of kids in the back and all of the things that goes with that. 
but they're always asking, you know, sometimes 15 minutes into a 20 hour drive, are we there yet? You know, we can be like that with God. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? You know what? How about look out the window and enjoy the journey? There's a beautiful view out there. No, we're not there yet, but we're on a journey and there are beautiful things to see on the way, beautiful people to meet on the way. And I just trust God's timing. And when we try to get ahead of God's timing, it doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. And I could preach on that. And I, I will probably do a lesson on that because it's so important for us to understand. So at the beginning of this message, I talked about the woman who quit before reaching her destination. And now I'd like to share the rest of the story. Two months after Chadwick's failed attempt, she tried the swim once more. Once again, a thick fog set in, but this time she had a mental image of the shoreline in her mind as she pushed herself along. And not only did she succeed, but Chadwick ended up making the swim an additional two times. For good measure, Chadwick also became the first woman to swing the, swim the English Channel in both directions. The point here is that we can learn from our mistakes, connect with God, pivot, make adjustments, and try again. Amen. Try again. Don't quit. Don't ever quit. Don't ever give up. Encourage yourself in the Lord as David did. Connect with God. Surround yourself with people who have been through this before and understand that you're waiting with God, not just waiting on God. These are things that have really encouraged me. And to have that perspective, that heavenly perspective, that whatever we're going through on this earth, these are light afflictions compared to an eternity with the Lord. You know, I've said this before, but one day we're all going to sit around a heavenly campfire and we're going to share war stories. Remember the time when this happened, remember the time when God parted the Red Sea, remember when God raised the dead, remember the time when you were persecuted for your faith, remember the time when we saw Jesus show up in the fire, remember the time, remember the time, you know what, we have a uh, an opportunity right here and now, and this is the only one we're going to get to make those heavenly war stories good, and I want mine to be good, amen, I don't want to sit there and say, well, um, I was super fearful and I shared a couple of Facebook posts and I, uh, you know, I want to be say, you know what? I was, I was afraid, but courage is doing it afraid. And I connected with God and he encouraged me and I moved forward and I kept going. And even though it was foggy out, I heard the voice of my father say, Michelle, you're almost there. You're almost to the finish line. You're so close. I know you were so beyond exhausted but I want you to keep going. I'm so proud of you. Don't give up because you're this close to the finish line. Keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Amen. Keep running. Keep going. That's what God is saying to us today. So I hope that this encourages you. And I want to close with one of my favorite scriptures. It's Philippians 1, 6. And it says this, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. God will finish the work he began in you and he knows what he's doing. And also Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season, timing, in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. Amen. That is so powerful. So God bless you. I hope this message encourages you. And if you're struggling, if you're just like, Michelle, I am so weary. I want to give up please reach out to me. You can do that through the Facebook page. You can also do that through our website, themindchurchozarks.com. And I would love to connect with you, to pray with you, to encourage you on your journey and to not give up because it is so worth it to continue this beautiful race with Jesus. So thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time at The Vine. You have a blessed day. Bye-bye.